the person that's buying a winter coat has a much higher propensity of purchasing board shorts in the summertime. So extending your cookie windows to address those customers or those timeframes, you can start to then tailor your messaging to that time window. Hello, and welcome to another episode of What's Working in E-Commerce. I'm your host, Egan Heath. I'm a partner at Asymmetric Marketing, and you can check out some of the work we do with our clients at asymmetric.pro. Today, I'm spe speaking with a fellow agency owner. We have on Adam Ortman from Kinetic 319. Adam, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Egan. Good to be here. Right on. It's good to have you. We were just talking about the lovely maps you have in the background. You have Hanoi, Denver, and Barcelona, <laughs> and I was saying... That's great decoration. I need to get some maps on the wall. Good idea. When I'm not nerding about marketing every hour of my life, I'm usually somewhere around the world. So I, I like to surround myself with it. Yeah. Love it. And Denver's not a bad place to be based out of at all. I'm speaking to you from Madison, Wisconsin today. So glad to have you. Tell us a bit about what you guys do at Kinetic 319, the clients you work with. Yeah, absolutely. So we are a full service marketing agency. We work with everything digital and traditional from strategy, planning, campaign execution, analytics, live dashboarding, surveying, things of that nature, as well as all, all things SEO. So technical SEO, on page, off page, as well as all the content writing. So loving what we're doing. Love it. I have a note to ask you about social commerce and just how you think about that. Maybe you could talk about that and how you guys approach it. Yeah, we just were in a, pub, in a trade publication on this specific topic. I believe it was Total Retail where we were talking about social commerce. And anytime that I have the ability to leverage some consumer psychology bits of my past, I jump on it. And social commerce is really interesting because you're leveraging the technical bits of all things marketing, audience targeting and campaign strategy, but you're also leaning on something that's inherently psychological for a lot of folks. I actually spoke about FOMO, specifically fear of missing out, which was actually just published in psychological journals just recently over the last 10 years as an actual condition. I know that a lot of the a lot of the kids these days are talking about FOMO even still to this day, but it's very much so something that goes hand in hand with social commerce, just understanding that whether you're using influencer tactics or you're just you know, running ads on your own, inherently you're marketing to a person that is socially driven. And there's also greater psychology behind that decision making and the haste in which they make decisions and how they're influenced. So it was a... Uh, that was a fun piece to write. Very cool. I wonder if you can give an example or if anything comes to mind of how did you use that fear of missing out maybe in some marketing or in an ad campaign? Yeah. So fear of missing out is really fun, especially when you're leveraging influencers and then remarketing off of any of that specific traffic because how we have seen success is any influencer traffic that comes in, you're wanting to get in front of them very quickly because when a person is impacted by, let's just say a piece of clothing or a new pair of shoes or whatever that is, and then they consistently see it frequently around the web, they get a sense of, oh, I, I don't have that. Maybe I should have that because I'm seeing it everywhere. So having very aggressive remarketing tactics paired with influencer tactics, that's a no brainer for me. I love it. I see in your LinkedIn, you mentioned a uh, consumer psychologist. Maybe you could say more about what that means to you and how you approach that. Oh, I'm obsessed with it. It's actually part of my education background. My master's is in uh, professional mass communications with an emphasis in consumer psychology. And I love all things. But back then it was very academic. Now I actually get to see it in practice and in theory, which I like both sides of that coin. But understanding what motivations and priorities people have. And when I say people, people as they pertain to brands. So who is my target audience? What are their needs and wants and desires and priorities? And how do you create a very symbiotic bond between brands and consumers. And I, I get fascinated by that because I think in today's day and age of choice, you have to tell a story with your brand and you have to build relationships with your customers. And it's that understanding of the psychology and really building a very strong persona of your target audience for brands is incredibly important to make long-term loyal loyalists, basically champions for your brands. So all of the campaigns that we do at Kinetic 319, we bake in this type of persona building, understanding the audience. And even at Kinetic 319, 
all of our teams basically go through the sales process of our brand's customers. And to give you an example, we were just working with a national rehab brand, like a chain of rehabilitation centers, like physical rehab. And everyone on the team clicked on an ad, made an appointment, went to, <laughs> went to the brick and mortar location, got all the follow-up emails. And so not only are we be working with them to help support their brand from a marketing perspective, but we're also understanding their consumers. And at the end of the day, understanding the consumer psychology that could potentially go around working with them in that capacity. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That reminds me a bit of Russell Brunson talks about funnel hacking of go through someone else's funnels, see what it looks like. And I think that's a good yeah. practice in general for those of us doing client work or those of us on the brand side of don't just have your marketing floating out there, actually go through it and see it step by step on the exact devices and in the sort of mind frame that uh, your customers would. So that's a great one. Live your marketing, Egan. That's good. That's good. Anything else you see? Is there anything people doing wrong when it comes to, say, consumer psychology or how they're approaching their marketing? Ooh, we see this a lot today, especially when you have, and I actually just spoke about this on a political issue regarding neutrality or how do I specifically speak on a, maybe a, a polarized topic. This is very recent in today's given the election. How brands should always understand is you have a very large well of value in your customer base and you should be communicating with them often. And what that means is survey them, have conversations about what they like, what they don't like. That does not necessarily even need to be about your brand. It could also be about the world that they live in. And the error that is made is brand owners or leaders often put themselves in the shoes of their consumer and then project their own feelings or perspectives onto what they feel is going to be best for their customer, whatever that may be. That's one angle of that. The other angle of that is maybe you only survey a very small subset and then you project that result to a larger, let's say, national audience. That's actually, that's called a projection fallacy. And so those types of mistakes are constantly made. So that's something I, I actually think that Bud Light probably went through that when they were yep. in going through their most recent business hurdles. But those are some items that that brands should be aware of and just be very cognizant and over communicate and over, over survey. Yeah. This is a subject I like to ask marketing people about. I've been at conferences over the years of even hot topics of even Colin Kaepernick and Nike and things like that too. Yeah. Um, are, yeah. You, are you on the side of don't ever take a stand on a controversial thing as a brand, <laughs> or if you really know, who your audience is and you know how they fall. It doesn't ever make sense to take a controversial stand. I, my advice, and I just spoke about this as well. My advice is to take the stance of the foundations of your brand, whether that is empowerment, like Nike community building quality. Coca-Cola is like love and connection. So those are universal foundations that will always be positive in the public eye. I do say, though, that brands who often take a stance, that if you don't take a stance on something, be prepared for the world to ask you why you're not talking about it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if you decide to not take a stance, and typically you are a very vocal brand, have something prepared, work with your brand strategist team or your PR team to have something in your back pocket as to why you are not necessarily taking a stance on something. Yeah, pretty interesting. It's quite the world we're living in. So I, I appreciate your uh, input on that. That's great. Yeah. I want to ask you a bit about out of home advertising. <laughs> I don't think anyone has talked on the show mm. about this. Maybe you may even need to define what this means and then make the case for it to uh, e-commerce folks who are often very digital first and digital only. Absolutely. Out of home. I was at an out-of-home conference two years ago, Egan, and I never thought that I would have joined an out-of-home conference in my life, being a primarily digital marketer. I have, we do both traditional and digital marketing all day long, but digital is typically the lion's share of most campaigns. So out-of-home is a really interesting dynamic in regards to how it has evolved over time. 
And out of home is defined as really anything that's billboards, digital screens, paste up screens. You can put it on the side of a boat, of a bus. So basically any, any type of larger, rich media that you see out in the world rather than online. So think of a display banner in real life. And the technology that has now been, so there's actually a couple of things about a home that I would bring up. The technology that's now being packed into this, where surface level boards, basically things that you see that are eye level when you're walking on the street, those can now pick up your device signal. And we can now understand if you've been within viewing range of a specific board and then potentially remark it back to you online. So the, there is a lot of technological advancement that's happening here. And we have, I'm going to give a shout out to Quan Media, Q-U-A-N, who is our go-to out-of-home vendor that I've known Brian Rappaport for many years. He's a great colleague of mine. He's doing amazing things. They have done very strategic work with us on doing types of advertising that are not only... I would say they're not your father's billboards <laughs> anymore. You could add a specific figure or model or statue building outside of a bus stop cover, for example. You don't have to think about it just as a two-dimensional item as well. So not only is the technology increasing and just the creativity around out of home, but also just when you're looking at media costs and CPMs. Because we all know that the days of dollar clicks are well behind us now. I am actually seeing a more of a movement back to traditional mediums because inherently they are less expensive. So we're having more conversations about linear TV. We're having more conversations about um, out of home or other tactics very similar to that because digital media is becoming more, much more expensive and much more competitive. And so thinking about out of home while it may have a larger stand-up price tag, try to measure the larger impact when it comes to impression volumes, that cost per impression, and just the general buzz that you're going to be getting. Because oftentimes, you can put up an amazing, rich media deployment, and that could circulate with news buzz. You can get some secondary impacts is there, there as well. I'm curious how you talk with your clients about the attribution piece of it. It sounds like you said there's ways to remarket and do other things now, but for oh, yeah. people who are coming from running meta ads, running Google ads, really having that attribution, even the cost cost per acquisition and ROAS at, within their dashboard, how do you think about that when you're doing out of home advertising? That's a great question. It's not easy. So you will have some algorithms in place with some of the vendors that you work with, like the measurement vendors that will do the mobile attachments. I like to do basically market in market and control markets. So if you're running the same type of media in multiple markets, you would select three similar markets to each other, whether that is based on household income, demographic makeup, whatever that may be. And you're going to want to, let's just say three and three, right? Run billboards in three markets. And then you have a control set that is running the same type of digital media, but no billboards. And basically you're comparing them. side to side. You can do that. Or you can do a, a latency testing, which is period of, I would say, a non-seasonally high period of time pre and post. So you're basically measuring performance three to six months before without billboards, and then you're measuring three to six months after. And then you would actually want to do another control after that as well. So there's a couple of ways of getting to, I would not necessarily say a statistically significant amount, but you'd be able to start to see correlation. Yeah. And it, tell me if I have this wrong, but there could be geographical testing, time-based testing, and it's almost old school of return on marketing sort of measurements, not yeah. just straight return on ad spend attributed to one channel. Do I have that right? You are. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. yeah. Pretty interesting. As we were chatting before too, you mentioned there's this idea of like seasonal remarketing on social media mm. platforms. Can you talk about that? Yeah. It's one of my favorite things, especially with e-commerce just retail brands in, in general, I think one of the biggest opportunities that exist for brands today that they're not leveraging into, they're not leveraging audiences and tools that are available to them. There's a lot going on within Meta, within Google, within TikTok, where 
you can build very powerful audiences from scratch, right? You don't necessarily just need to lean on the ones that are built in. You can create custom affinities, you can create custom combinations. There's a lot of things that we can do now these days. One of the areas is also just leaning on the default cookie windows that your audiences are built with. So typically it's about 30 days, I think. And so you have control to expand that window. And it's a tactic that I actually like for retail and e-commerce brands around this idea of, of seasonal remarketing. And Egan, I'm going to claim that, by the way. TM, seasonal Good. remarketing. Thank Good. You. It's a nice one. It's what happens when you have a retail brand that has very seasonal product cycles. So you may have a winter fashion and you may have a, a summer set of products, whatever that may be. Where when you're looking at re-engaging customers that have bought previously, so let's just say like Ruka is a great brand that I've worked with in the past. They had winter coats, for example. A person that's buying a winter coat is has a much higher propensity of purchasing board shorts in the summertime. So extending your cookie windows to address those customers or those time frames in 80 days, you can start to then tailor your messaging to that time window because you know that person has already purchased. You could even get to the point where you're saying, hey, did when you purchase this, look at what we have now. So there's a lot of creativity that you can back into that. But audiences are incredibly important and seasonal marketing for any retail brand is something that you should be doing. Yeah, pretty interesting. I'm, I'm thinking through the nuts and bolts on it of, I know, say in the Meta Ads Manager, you can up, update that cookie window. If I want 180 days or what have you. But if I want to do it every October, it seems like I may need to pull the data and create a custom audience, maybe out of Klaviyo or my email tool or somewhere else. If I just want to say they were on our site or they bought from us last October, I want them to see my ads again. Am I thinking about that the right way? You are. You can also create those customer lists, those customer matches. And then you can also do lookalikes, which is not necessarily a re-engagement tactic, but it's also the more of a prospecting tactic. So if you're wanting to go after those people that are bored, buying board shorts or Halloween decorations in October, whatever it may be, slicing and dicing your audience is always very important. Doing the segmentation. Yeah, fully agree there. Mm -hmm. I wonder, Adam, can you talk broadly about... Where are we headed here? AI is obviously a big topic. TikTok and what's going on there. There's so many ways to take this, but I saw on your yeah. LinkedIn, you, you wrote for Entrepreneur even about the metaverse and things like that. So based on everything you're taking in and how you're thinking about this, where are we headed? How are things changing and where should brands be looking? Well, I, haven't, I try to polish my crystal ball again as much as I can. It's a little cloudy sometimes given the daily trend of work that we work in. I think that AI is here to stay. I'm not worried about it. I'm not concerned about it. I actually see it as a different hammer. It's a different tool for us to use as marketers, as brands, as companies, um, even as consumers. So I try not to talk too much about AI just because, you can, like I said earlier to you, you can throw a stick in this place and hit 20 articles about AI and there's so much buzz around it. What I think that is not necessarily being focused on, and this may still be a few years in the future, where technology in the VR, AR space is becoming accessible. And the release of the Vision Pro by Apple is a very interesting pillar in our technological time frame as consumers using technology, just as it was when they released the iPhone. And so what that's telling me as a marketer is, oh, okay, this technology is becoming more available. It's becoming more accessible to average consumers. It's, it's expensive right now, but that cost will go down. It's going to become lighter. It's going to become more wearable. It's going to become more integrated in our lives, just as a phone would be. My prediction is, honestly, once we start to interact with that type of technology, more these wearable technologies that augment or even virtualize the world, Brands are going to start to need to start to see themselves and ask themselves, how do we interact with consumers in this new way? Because it's interesting. I, one of the blogs that we had written on Connect 319's website is VR killed the video star. And it's going to, it talks about how people today are asking literally or almost verbatim the same questions that they were taught they were asking about the internet in the 90s. This is just a fad. Will this actually take off? I don't see myself using this. 
And so it, my prediction is, yes, while AI is a hot buzz right now, AI is actually just a larger component to what I feel is going to be a different environment or a new Wild West for brands in the future, because you're going to have to deal with consumers who are walking down a virtual road, looking at virtual billboards and interacting with your pair of shoes in a completely different way than they ever have before. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. If you're game for that innovation, I agree. I just had a, I just had my 40th birthday party and had a bunch of old friends come to town, had a great time. Happy birthday. You Thank you. Yeah. And had old college friends show up and they're in totally different industries. And in many cases, they're not even in private sector. So they're in education, cool. nonprofit, things like that. And we were talking over brunch, like it, it comes to AI and everybody was pretty negative, pretty bearish on AI and mocking it from easy sure. mistakes and things like that. And I was like, are you guys serious? This is, yeah. this is going to be a game changer. And the sort of concerns you have of it makes these little mistakes or this and that, I'm like, that's going to be ironed out in one to three years max. And it's already Easily. changing, the, at least for the work we do, our workflows are different. And even who we hire and how we hire and what even what a day of work looks like is completely Absolutely. changing. And it's, it's only going to get more and more sophisticated. So I'm also a big believer in you know, following what's going on. I've also talked about when you're talking about the VR and AR and the metaverse and things like that, there's some marketing fundamentals that we learn and there's principles mm -hmm. of content marketing, building trust, building authority. Maybe you could say yeah. influencer marketing or affiliate marketing, maybe advertising, yeah. right? Those are all, those are all kind of tactics we use or tools within it. And the fundamentals of what we do likely will not change, but where people's attention is going will change. And so with the Apple Vision Pro or any of the other VR tools, it's I think for us as marketers, we have to watch how many hours a day are people spending on this and is it increasing? You know, wherever their attention is, that is where marketers of the future need to be. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Marketing, it doesn't matter what it is or what device it is, it's all about attention. We're all fighting for attention. And that attention, whether it be your phone or a TV or your Apple Watch or whatever it is, you're, it's a constant battle every single day. That's good. I want, I wonder if I could ask a sort of meta question about the metaverse here. You, you got this article again, a great article in entrepreneur. I wonder if you could just talk about the PR of that. And I'm sure you <laughs> wrote a lot of articles and built up to that, but for people watching this or listening to this, that would love to get featured in a publication like entrepreneur.com or another mm -hmm. one. I wonder if you can just talk about that process and how you approach PR and guest article writing. When it comes to B2B work in general, so even myself expanding out into our going after attracting new clients or breaking into a new you know, type of marketing, whatever that may be, PR is always a great tactic because you need to be building not only awareness, but credibility within the space. And so anytime that you can share, and, and that's actually another item for me is that I always lead with help first. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. So whether it's the stay kinetic tips on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter that we do, which we put out every week and we're doing that every week. And it's just, and it's things that are small, but very helpful. Like for, so for example, your Google campaigns will now launch by default with broad keywords automatically being added unless you turn it off. <laughs> So turn it right. off. <laughs> so turn it off. <laughs> yeah. So that's your stay kinetic tip for today. But basically that's just leading Good to my PR is that I always like to lead with help first. And when it's a topic like VR and AR that I'm personally passionate about, or I want to nerd out about, I usually try to jump on those. I also have a great PR team that uh, gets me involved with a lot of really great conversations. And frankly, I'm just humbled by those types of conversations because not only does it give me a greater awareness of just what's going on in this space, but it also just, it, it shows that, oh, okay, I'm, we're doing right. We're doing good work. We're doing good work. Yeah, that's great. This might be a, a two nuts and bolts, but in this case, don't fear the metaverse. Okay. We've been here before. Did you already have the piece written? Did you have a short version of it? Did you just pitch the topic? I wonder if you could talk about that of, is it, we've got that this, was, we're to publish it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So that was actually a, a feed off of the AR killed the video star. And okay. so we talk about very similar trends there where it's asking the same questions about the internet. We've been here before. We've been here before with the internet. We've, we as marketers learned about paid search and display advertising and social media as that became prevalent in the late 2000s, 2010s, I would say, you know, 2007. So 
those types of topics are always really fun. But yes, I had I already had some thoughts around that topic before moving forward with that. I'm glad you mentioned the Google ads example. That's a great one. We we're in a similar space in, in terms of that. And Google in particular seems to really be pushing automation and we've not seen evidence that it's driving a lot better performance. I wonder if you can comment on that and just how you approach it. How do you test as Meta and Google and these other platforms try to take away more and more of the levers and just automate it? How do you test that while still making sure you're driving results for your clients? A very good example that I like to use, and this is very nuts and bolts, which might be good for this. When Google is launching all of these types of things, number one is how do we remain, how do we maintain control? Because we always know that every click, Google's making money. So inherently, them as a business wants more clicks. But we want to make sure, especially as marketing agencies such as ourselves, we want to ensure that we're always doing the best job of being stewards for our clients and protecting their budgets. So in implementing as much control against that budget as possible is really in everyone's best interest. Maybe not Google's, but everyone's best interest. And so as an example, with the broad match, I'm not a huge fan of broad match in general, but that might just be me. That's just my opinion. How I use broad match and how my team uses broad match is we will actually create middle to lower funnel Google campaigns, Bing campaigns. We use Bing too for phrase and exact match really only. And we will create a specific broad campaign that is upper funnel that we use as a small budget for harvesting new keywords. So that harvesting strategy is what you should be thinking about when you're thinking about broad, because it's good for us as marketers to understand how is Google approaching this brand and what other terms is it aligning to or themes or whatever that may be. And so then we can start to say, okay, negative keyword. Okay. Let's pull this one down into our actual targeted keyword set. So it gives us greater transparency and insight into how Google's thinking but I don't want to give away the farm with my broad match. Yeah, that's a great strategy. Thank you for talking about that. And I, would, I think my of business course. partner, Mark Hope would say, you can do a similar thing in Amazon as well. So that's an excellent yes, one. Yes, you can. This yes, is you can. great. Adam, we've covered a lot of territory here. For anybody who's interested, these guys are at kinetic319 with the numbers.com. Adam, is the, I, I know you're on Adam Ortman at LinkedIn. Are there other places you encourage people to follow you and find you and learn from you? Absolutely. So follow us on LinkedIn, on Twitter at connect319.com, also on Facebook. Like I said, we're posting a lot, not only in our blog, but also our Stay Connect Kinetic Tips launched a few weeks back and we're actually getting a lot of traction with those. So definitely follow us. And, and honestly, also, if you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out to us directly. My email address is adam at connect319.com. Happy to help. All right. Adam Ortman, thank you for coming on and sharing what's working in e-commerce. Thank you.